Thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning and worshiping Jesus. He's worthy of our praise. We've been in a theme, a question, can you imagine? And um, last week we began part one of this, this, this message, can you imagine our future? Today we're going to talk about part two, can you imagine our future? And uh, our theme verse during all of this time, did, did you hear, what, what time is the membership meeting tonight? Thank you. Just want to make sure you got, you got that. Our theme verse is Ephesians chapter 3. Read it or follow along as I read it. For this reason, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for this reason to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That's a lot, right? How many think he has a lot of glory? That he would grant, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell where? In your hearts. How? That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. That's such an important word. doesn't mean believe in a new doctrine. It means experience it in your life, that you may be able to experience with everybody, all the saints, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ. You can feel Paul exploding here. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine, according to the power that works where? It's in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. To all the Jesus clubs that are yet to come, forever and ever. Amen. Now, also a passage that we worked from just a few weeks ago, Mark chapter 4. Jesus called this the most important parable in the New Testament. So here we go. He, Jesus, taught them many things by parables. And he said to them in his teaching, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. You guys know that's a farmer, right? We're not talking about a seamstress here. We're talking about a farmer. As it happened, as he sowed, that some of the seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. Immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. Scorched earth because it had no oh, root. It withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and they choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground. It fell on good ground, and it yielded a crop that sprang up, and it increased, and it produced some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. And he said to them, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, we're going to skip a little bit. We're going to go a little bit to, I think it's verse, what verse is it? Verse 13. Verse 13, Jesus now takes his disciples aside. He's been talking to the crowd. Now he's taking his disciples and explaining to the 12, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, when they hear, Satan goes into action. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and he takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves, so they endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, Immediately they, they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word of God. And the, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things, enter in and they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. 
but there are some <laughs> where the seed falls on good ground. Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit. And when the fruit comes, it might be 30-fold, it might be 60-fold, it might be 100-fold, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to come is the point. Yeah. This is God's word. Amen. I love you so much. You may be seated. This is a historic day in our church. You've been hearing for a number of weeks now that today is a day we want to very uniquely express our faith and our love. Our faith and our love. And we're going to do it through generosity. This is really a vision of expanded supply. God, come on, does not want his children to live in desperate need. We're not a hand-to-mouth people. Come on, that was wilderness. That's not, that's not the way we are. Everything that God is leading us into, we need to understand it to be for the purpose of introducing new supply. Yeah, yeah. If God's leading you to buy a new house, he already has the supply. He's trying to get you to it. If God is leading you to start a new business, the supply for the business is already there. He's trying to lead us into the supply. If he's leading me to give an extravagant gift, he's trying to lead me into a supply for extravagant giving. God does not lead us into need. He leads us into fullness. His will is that we would be filled with, come on, say it, fullness. The fullness. And so the vision that we're, that we're stewarding is this jubilee vision. You may know, you heard it, 50 years. Every 50 years, the slaves returned to their land and all the debts were canceled. And, and what Jacob has been praying, what we've all been praying, is that this is not just for the house of God, this is for the house of everybody. <laughs> like, like, like we're building this canopy of financial freedom and prosperity and it, every, everyone who steps into it is going to be overtaken by the blessings of the Lord. So starting today, today, everybody say today, today, for the next 24 months, that doesn't, that's not very long, but for the next 24 months, we're believing that our church can give an extra $80,000, a little more actually, 80, 80 something thousand dollars every month, and that would total $1.6 million, which is what we need to meet the first goal. We began the day today with faith promise cards, pledge cards of 1.57 million, uh, excuse me, 1.53 million. So we had room for about 70,000 more uh, in faith. We needed about 70,000 in the early service for them to give that much faith so that we could meet the first goal of 1.6. I'm losing you with the numbers, right? But I have to tell you, after the early service this morning, I have an up-to-date number, and the pledges now are at $1.755 million. <laughs> so so there, there was a lot of movement in the, in the first service this morning. And, and the, whole, the whole idea is that, is that we would step into new supply. I just wanted to show you this profile of giving because I don't think a lot of people understood this. Um, what we believed is that as people began to decide how they were going to give, we believed that at least one person would give a gift of $100,000. We, we have someone that's actually pledged to give a gift of $100,000, so that's amazing. We also believed that at least four people would give $50,000. Well, we have three people that so far have pledged. I didn't see the morning pledges, but we have at least three that have pledged to give $50,000. Tim, are you here? How many people did you say had pledged 25? 11 people have pledged $25,000. And so, the, the, like, the profiles, the profiles in giving have really been um, really, really uh, stewarded well. The two areas that we're kind of missing are, like, people who believe God for $10,000 over the next 24 months and people who believe God for $15,000 over the... We have a lot of people who have said they were going to give... <laughs> at least $9 a week for $1,000. And so we're thankful for all of that. That was an extraordinary amount of people. But we just, if God would speak to you about a $10,000 commitment or a $15,000 commitment, that's really where we're hoping to get, get some strength today. Anyway, what are we trying to do? <laughs> we're emphasizing two 
things. Number one, the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. And our future with God based on his faithfulness. See, 48 years ago, 18 people gathered in Jimmy Kennedy's house. She was in the early service this morning. And, and they were, her living room was filled with the smell of sloppy joes as they ate together and dreamed about Trinity Church. And now it's our turn to imagine the, the future. And we've tried to bring out some of the old stories of Trinity, some of the defining stories, because we think they illustrate the faithfulness of God. One of my favorite stories is the story of San Juan de los Lagos, and I'll try to do this quickly, but we were ready to restart our world impact, our world influence with missions, and, and missionary Mike McGee introduced us to a city named San Juan de los Lagos, and the nickname of that city was Nest of Satan nest of Satan. And the reason it was such a tough place was because no churches had been able to really plant there. And we decided for one year we were going to focus on this city in Mexico, San Juan de los Lagos. And the, the feature of this city is that the only church that was there worshipped around a doll. And the name of the doll was the Virgin of San Juan. And literally a million people would take spiritual pilgrimage to San Juan de los Lagos and they would crawl on their knees to a shrine where the doll was kept and they would worship the doll. Now, this is beyond my ability to understand, but people would come on their knees to touch the virgin and be healed. And I will tell you, I don't know if this was just a con or really what happened, but there was a shrine filled with wheelchairs and crutches and walkers where people who had touched the doll had been healed and they left their stuff there. And I just remember how jealous I am for the Lord Jesus. I feel like out in our foyer, we're going to start hanging wheelchairs and chair and crutches and stuff because if faith works at that level in something that's just like two or three places removed from Jesus, if we just have faith in Jesus, no telling. Anyway, we sent a prayer team to San Juan de los Lagos and we're just praying three or four days over the city and one of our teenage girls was sitting on a park bench and was approached by a dignified young lady, uh, not lady, a uh, young, but she was in her middle ages, and she said, uh, what are you doing in my town? And we had trained ourselves to answer that question. We're looking for a city to invest in. We're looking for a city to invest in. She said, well, my husband is the mayor of this town. Bring your team to our house for dinner tonight. And so we all gathered at the mayor's house of San Juan de los Lagos. Anybody on that trip that's in the room here? A few of you remember the trip. And, and so we went to the mayor's house, and we met the mayor, and we exchanged ideas. And he said, do you think it would be possible for our city to exchange keys with your city? At the time, I didn't even know what city I was representing, to be honest with you. I didn't know any of the mayors that are around here, but I said, sure, it was a faith statement, sure, we can exchange keys. And I came home and I invited three different mayors for, um, for lunch. I invited the mayor of Duncanville, DeSoto, and Cedar Hill. The mayor of DeSoto and the mayor of Cedar Hill said, sure, we'll travel with you to some place in Mexico we've never heard of before. And along with those mayors were the chief of police and the city manager, who was Alan Sims at the time. And for one year, we trained their responders. We trained that we had business expos. We, we brought shoes for their soccer team. We, uh, we uh, had art shows and, and all kinds of, we painted the schools. We did all kinds of things. Well, the translator, who was our host for all of that, Incognito was a church planter, and his dream was to plant a Pentecostal church in San Juan de los Lagos, and he was getting all the credit for all the good things that were happening at their city. And I'll just cut to the chase, but at the end of the year, they finished a, their, their, their pride and joy. Their jewel was a new theater that they were building for San Juan de los Lagos, and uh, their very first drama in the new theater was our team providing, I don't hold this against us, a drama, you guys know it, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. Does anybody remember that back in the day? Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. And literally thousands of people accepted Christ as their Savior in San Juan de los Lagos, and a church was planted, and the saying began 
that is still going on today. If it can happen in San Juan, it can happen anywhere in Mexico. Now, I'm telling you that because those are the root stories by which our faith exists today. That's really where our faith for city transformation began for Cedar Hill and DeSoto, not Duncanville, because they wouldn't send a mayor where there's no, I'm just kidding. We like Duncanville too. But the point I'm trying to make is that our future depends on our perspective of God's faithfulness. Our future requires God's faithfulness. That's what faith is. Faith is our attitude toward the faithfulness of God. I'm going to say it again because it's important. Faith is our attitude toward the faithfulness of God. Deuteronomy 7, 9, it's just been so powerful in my heart recently. Uh, let me read it to you. It says, the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 7, 9, the Lord your God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him. Wow. The Lord our God. Come on, somebody. Is he your God today? The Lord our God is the faithful God. What does that mean? It means he's obligated by his nature to be faithful. He's obligated by his nature to be faithful. Like a, like a friend, like a, like a witness that gives an oath in court, like a, like a covenant partner, God is rigidly aware of his obligations to our relationship. He, he, his faithfulness is the force that comes into our lives from heaven. His faithfulness invades our stories. We can lean on his faithfulness. We can build on his faithfulness. God cannot begin something that he will not finish. God cannot create something he will not care for. He cannot say something without fulfilling his word. He cannot withhold mercy to those who present themselves in need of mercy. He's a faithful God. I wish somebody in the 11 o'clock service would just feel that the way I feel that today. He is a faithful God. Maybe you're just too young to know today. He's a faithful God. He's been faithful. It's his nature. It's his nature to be faithful. And, and so our faith proves the faithfulness of God. Our future rests on the faithfulness of God. This prayer that we've been studying in Ephesians is just opening so many possibilities for us. If you remember last week, we talked about how the story of Ephesus began in Acts chapter 19, where there were 12 men. I don't know if they were cooking sloppy joes or not, but there were 12 men, and they were dreaming about a church in their city, and Paul showed up on a missionary journey, and they were, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and there was this upending of evil and lots and lots of miracles. 30 years later... Paul writes this letter called Ephesians. He's writing it from Rome's prison. He's in prison. He's writing it from the dungeon. And he's remembering God's faithfulness and he's imagining the future of the Ephesians. Now, I just love Paul. I love this prayer because he's not praying to get out of jail. That's what I would be praying. God, how long am I going to be in this dungeon, right? He's not praying that. He's not praying for protection from the Roman soldiers. He's not praying to get a promotion at work. He's praying for experiences and apprehensions with God that would make that church that he was part of for 30 years. He's saying, God, would you please, this, like this is a capacity prayer, would you please do something for us so that this Ephesus church could fulfill the purpose for which it started in the first place? Now, if we had time, we'd talk about the purpose because purpose is a big word for Paul throughout the book of Ephesians. But, but the purpose basically is that the church is supposed to enforce the victory of the resurrection. The church is supposed to break down the gates of hell. The purpose of the church is to make manifold the wisdom of God to principalities and powers. The purpose is to recover what's been broken and lost. But the, but the prayer begs questions of us today. 
been here 30 years, so I'm kind of relating to the 30-year journey, but the questions last week we asked, are we going to pay attention to the Holy Spirit? Are we going to prioritize being filled with the fullness of God? That's what he's praying. He's praying that they would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner man, that they would be filled with the fullness of God. And I'm just so, I'm so desperate for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to know with certainty the power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. The same power that the early church operated with is ours. The second question that begs to be asked through this prayer is the, is the question, will we, will we pray? Will we pray? Paul said, this is the reason that I bow my knees. I'm praying, and it's attached to the purpose of the church. And we just mentioned two things. I never got this in, the, in last week's second service. We preached it in the first service. But in the second service, let me just say two things about prayerlessness. Prayerlessness empowers scarcity. Yeah, the Bible says, James says, well, you have not because you ask not. And so prayerlessness psychologically separates us from our awareness that we have a God who is transcendent, who brings resources into the earth. Prayerlessness just makes us think we're on our own all the time. And the second thing about prayerlessness is that prayerlessness puts us in conflicts that we were never meant to fight in the first place. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those or not, but, but, but Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. There are some fights that we shouldn't even have to fight. We would have avoided them if we had been prayerful. And even if we win the fight, the point is, we didn't have to fight that fight in the first place if we had just been prayerful. But, but that was last week. This is this week. Are you ready? Question number three. Are we going to walk in faith and love? We're going to live in faith and love. Here's the part of the prayer that is so important. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Through what? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? That you being rooted and grounded in what? May be able to comprehend with all the saints. So we're doing this together. What is the width and the length and the depth and the height? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 19, that we would know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. All right. Here's the story. 30 years ago, Paul, his name was Saul, is arresting Christians. He, he is a vicious person, but on the road to arrest the Christians, he's blinded so that he can finally see. He's blinded so that he can finally see. And his name gets changed from Saul to Paul, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. 30 years later, he's writing this letter, and he's been through a lot. Oh, my goodness. He's been in prison. He's been in the middle of riots. <laughs> he's, he's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He, he's, he's, he's been hungry. He's been abandoned by his friends. But aren't you impressed with his prayer? He's not doubting. He's not, he's not pouting. He's not feeling sorry for himself. He's not cowering back or filled with offense. He's dreaming about the future. After 30 years, he's dreaming about the future. Come on, Paul, tell me your secret. How did you stay so faithful? How did you stay so joyful? How did you stay so full on the inside? Please mentor me. I could use some help with this. And Paul might say, well, it starts with the inner man. That, that's, that's where it is. I was listening to a story on YouTube this week about John Hagee. You guys know John Hagee? Kind of a famous preacher. And he was telling a story about, he was preaching at a conference and he has a, he has a, a bodyguard. He has a, a security person. And the security person is MMA, m mixed martial arts. He's a professional and he's, he's got all abs and biceps and stuff like, kind of like our security guys, you know, you get... <laughs> You see the abs and the biceps. We, 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 we like that. And, when, and this guy came in with a pistol. And when he came in with a pistol, the mixed martial arts guy who looked so strong, he literally slipped around the chair and started crawling out the side 
door and like he disappeared when the danger when the danger came the mixed martial arts guy that looked so strong he actually left the guy with the pistol came up to the platform pulled the trigger about four times and the bullets missed every time because I guess John Hagee has angels around him or, or something like that I, I, I don't know but the point of the story is you can look really strong on the outside and it's not the same as being strong on the inside Come on, I'm just saying biceps and abs are not the same as integrity and humility and generosity. And if we're going to be strong on the inside, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it matters. But you understand what I'm saying. So the question is, how do we get strong on the inside? How do we get strong on the inside? And Paul would say, you've got to grow a strong root. Yeah. He's, he says, Christ dwelling in you by faith Faith is what establishes Christ's love as the root. Faith establishes Christ's love as the root of your life. My yard guys told me this week that my jasmine ivy needs new soil. Like there's nothing wrong with the plants. It's just that there are no more nutrients in the soil. I got to bring some dirt in. All the nutrients are gone. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said in the parable of Mark chapter 4. He, he said the most important parable. He said some Christians are missing out because the soil is bad. Hmm. He said sometimes you look at the soil. It's got rocks in it. It's got weeds in it. It's got thorns in it. And the problem, sometimes the soil is so scorched that it can't grow roots. The soil is bad. And, and, and when Jesus explained that to his disciples, he said, don't you understand what's going on? It's the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The seed carries all the capacity. The seed carries all the potential. The challenge is always in the soil. He says, don't you guys get it? The seed is when God sends his word. His word is never going to return void. His word has the capacity within itself to do the very thing that seems impossible. So the problem is not the word. If there's a problem, check out the soil. He says, the soil is the condition of people's hearts. Now, now, how many of you know this? The way we treat God's word is a reflection of the way we treat our relationship with God. If I'm not paying attention to your word, I'm not paying attention to who you are. So his word, the way we treat his word is how we actually value God. And faith, everybody say faith. Faith is the conditioning of our soil to make it ready to receive the seed. Faith is what creates a condition so the seed can germinate. And if the seed germinates, come on, 30, 60, 100 mountains are going to move. If the seed can just germinate. So, so faith, faith chooses God's faithfulness. Over all the competitions. Yeah, I'll try this side over here. Man. Faith chooses God's faithfulness all over, over all the competitions. There's always a competition. There's always an, an, an apple in the, tr you know, in the garden, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's always something to see which seems to be more dynamic than the unseen realm. There's always some shrewd scheme of Satan to try to snatch the seed before the root can grow. But if there's anybody who ever gets Deuteronomy and says, no, 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 no. The Lord, my God, is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his love on, on those, his unfailing love on those who love him, then, then that's the condition of of a soil which perfectly receives the seed so that the fruit can come forth. 30 fold, 60 fold, 100. That's the nature of the kingdom. That's the nature of our God. Come on, say it with me. He's faithful. He's faithful. God is faithful. I guess if we had time, you could tell me about your roots because listen, if you're rooted in what other people think about you or if you're rooted in the cares of this world or you're rooted in some trauma that happened when you were a teenager or when, you know, you're rooted in the idea that you, you're not going to be happy unless you're married or you're rooted in the idea that you're not going to be happy unless you're married to the other person that you're married to now, somebody else, you know, unless you're, unless you're rooted in, if you're rooted in the love of money, if you're rooted in offense, then even prayer is not going to help you in the long term. Because the just shall live by their faith. 
right? So, Paul, please tell me, how did you go 30 years as a Christian and, and not get jaded? You went to church for 30 years and you're not sidelined by the church hurt. Come on, tell me, how did you not get weary and well-doing? How did you not become so critical? Everybody else was criticizing you. How did you, how did you get through all that? Paul, tell me. And he would say, I think he would say, I was rooted. I, I had a root. I, nothing's going to blow me down because my faith kept growing the love of Jesus Christ. Some idea would come. Some assignment from heaven would come. Some, some impulse from the Holy Spirit. And it would be like a seed in me. And because the seed was planted in the soil of faith, love would just grow. And I think Paul would have a testimony and say, I'm excited to go to heaven because there's going to be a lot of people there that are in heaven because I received some assignments from the Lord. There's going to be a lot of people who read the letters that I wrote while I was in prison. And it was because I received that assignment because I had, I had faith in my soil. And it just kept growing love. How I many of you know there are a lot of songs on your playlist that are called love songs, but they're actually lust songs? Right? When Prince says, I want to be your lover... He's not thinking about laying down his preferences and sacrificing his stuff so someone else can flourish. He's thinking about what he's going to get out of the relationship. And I just wonder if that's the way some people are in their relationship with God. Because lust is about getting and love is about giving. And that's why if we decide that we're going to root in God's love, we must become unselfish people. Yeah? That's why people tithe. Yeah. I felt the, I felt the room go, Psh. Yeah, you know I'm after your money. That's why everybody's sitting there and be so quiet today. You're, I, I feel your, your guardedness. It's okay. It's great preaching, Pastor. I have to encourage myself in the Lord like David's, all right? So, no, nah, I'm just like, no, nah, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. That's why people tithe, though, because, because actually there are three levels that the Bible talks about for generosity. To grow, to grow this root in your life, there are three levels. The first level is simply called the regulated level. Okay? That's the tithe. Tithe means tenth. It's the lowest level that the Bible ever talks about giving to the Lord. It doesn't talk about anything less than the, the tenth. And, and the tithe is when... God's people bring to the storehouse 10% of what God has already given to them. Jesus said in Luke eleven forty two, 42, you should do this. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, this, this you should do. And what I've learned is that tithe, tithe doesn't really even take faith for generosity. It just takes obedience. That's all that it really takes. And unfortunately, about half of the Christians in America, I don't think this problem exists around the rest of the world because they understand things better than we do, but about half of the Christians in America don't obey the Lord's encouragement, admonition, command to, to bring the tithe. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits of all your crops. He's talking about the tithe. Because that's one of the ways that you acknowledge the faithfulness of God. Malachi has the most interesting conversation on behalf of God to the people. He's like in between the people. And, and, he, and, and God says to Malachi the prophet, God says, don't say you love me when you're robbing me. Like, don't be handing me your leftovers. I mean, that's literally in the scripture. Don't hand me your leftovers. He said, you weary me with your words and your sacrifices. You weary me because your actions are contradicting your words. You're saying things, but, but I, I don't know if I believe them because you're not responsible with the tithe. And, and then he, he makes this promise. He says, if you would just... We, if you would just regulate your giving, I would open the window. I would give you so many blessings. Like, this is a generous God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out the heavens. I'm gonna, your gardens are going to be blessed. It's just going to be unbelievable if you would just regulate, regulate your giving. 
God is so generous. He's so generous. But after this regulated giving, there's another level of giving. I like to call this the reasonable level of giving. And this is offerings. You, you can't give offerings until after you've given the tithe. But if you've given your tithe, then you, at your discretion, you can give offerings. You can give offerings to your relatives, to the waiter at, the, at Saltgrass. You can give offerings to your friends, to Convoy of Hope. You can give all kinds of offerings. And listen, offerings are important because God sees every offering. He, he said, when you give a cup of cold water to someone, I see it. I, I take note of that. So offerings are extremely valuable, but they're reasonable. It's when you look at your checkbook and you say, well, what, what do I have in my savings now? What can I, what can I do? What can I give? If I, I have a testimony that someone started selling tennis shoes out of their closet so that they could make a donation to the Hennessy Foundation. It's like, oh, this will make sense. I can do this, and then I can give an offering here. Zacchaeus discovered the love of Jesus, and he reasoned his way into generosity. He said, oh, I remember how much I stole from everybody. Now it would be reasonable to give half of my possessions to the poor, and I'll repay everything that I've stolen. He reasoned his way into generosity. 2 Corinthians 8.11 says, you were so eager in your intentions to give. So go ahead, do it. Finish this act of worship according to your ability to give. So Paul says, yeah, think it through. Do some calculations. Let it be reasonable and then give cheerfully. That's the second level of giving. But then there's a third level of giving. And it's called revelation giving. And that is when God responds by faith to the unveiling of new levels of glory. He's ready for some seed to go to 30, 60, 100. And this is often an extravagant offering. This is, this is, this is the kind of offering that stimulates the supernatural. This is engaging God at levels that just literally prove that heaven is active in your story. That's what faith does. It proves the unseen. It proves. And so, and so when the temple was built, you know, David had imagined the temple. He's like, someday there's going to be a temple. There's going to be a location where heaven and earth can mingle together. And he had this revelation of the temple. He gave $20 billion. And that's what it amounted to, $20 billion. He gave $20 billion to his son to build a temple. He didn't get to build a temple, but he's imagining the future. And he's like, oh, I know that someday Solomon is going to, my son's going to build a temple and it's going to impact the nation and really the, the whole world. This, he said it, David said, this will be a great work for God. And so he had the revelation. Wow. And then Solomon, his son, built the temple with David's money. <laughs> and, and when David was ready to dedicate or when Solomon was ready to dedicate the temple, he could have just given one bull in dedication. That would have been a nice savor, a smell in the temple. He gave 22,000 bulls in sacrifice. 22,000 bulls in sacrifice. And God responded to the gift. He said, oh, Solomon, what you've done is so amazing. What can I do for you? Because our God is a God of reciprocity. Come on, somebody. He said, what can I do for you? And Solomon said, I just need enough wisdom to lead this nation effectively. I just need you to endow me with some knowledge and some strength. And God said, done. He said, but beyond that, I'm more generous. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you wealth and riches beyond your imagination. But, but the 22,000, does anybody see that the 22,000 bulls, triggered something in the supernatural realm, in the heart of God. And then John chapter 12, we're talking about revelation giving John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. There's a story of a daring faith, a, a woman named Mary, and she pours out oil on Jesus that is worth one year's wages. This is her family heirloom. This is her inheritance. And she's willing to break the alabaster box and to pour it on Jesus. But she's responding to revelation. She, one month earlier, had this amazing 
revelation of Jesus. She'd been hanging out with Jesus all her life. And she realized now that Jesus is the one who could call her brother Lazarus from the dead after being in the grave for four days. And so she has a revelation of Jesus that was beyond her previous revelation of Jesus. And she just can't stand it anymore. So when Jesus comes back to supper at Lazarus' house, they're sitting around the table. Mary comes in. This is awkward, y'all. She comes in. She puts her hair on his feet. She pours the oil. And Judas hates it because it's a reasonable offering. It's not a reasonable offering. He's like, oh, this could be given to the poor. Of course, Jesus knew that he's actually stealing money out of the offering anyway. How many of you are thankful you have a pastor that doesn't steal money out of the offering? Oh, that's beside the point anyway. Like, like this was a, an offering based on revelation. Now she knows Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus said, oh, leave her alone, Judas. Leave her alone. What she has done is going to be remembered forever and ever and ever. And here's the interesting part. The revelation that she received was way more than she imagined. He's the resurrection and the life. But the gift that she gave accomplished far more than she could imagine. She did not know that six days from the outpouring of the oil, Jesus was going to be crucified. And the only possibility of his body being anointed for burial was on that occasion when she poured out the extravagant revelation offering. When the woman with two pennies gave an offering, she gave it by revelation. She's like... It's not the amount of the money. It's who you see when you give. And Jesus looked at that offering and said, that's more than everybody else has put together. And said, her offering is going to establish the future. There's a new level of glory coming because she gave two pennies. So I'm kind of prophesying that today's generosity is going to accomplish far more than we ask or imagine. Faith says this gift is going to go forward and it's going to accomplish its purpose. And it's going to, there's another name for this kind of giving. I like this name a little better than revelation giving. See if you like it. it the name for this kind of giving is, I better stop and think about it. This is a stop and think about it gift. Right? I don't know if you've ever done that before. But when the oil was poured out, this was family heirloom. She's like, I better stop and think about, it. is Jesus worthy of this? She decided it was. Or the woman at Zarephath, you know, she's, she's in a famine. And Elijah the prophet shows up and says, bake me a cake. And she's like, I have just enough oil and flour for one final cake for myself and my son. This is our final meal. And then we're going we're gonna to eat it and then we're going to die. And, and the prophet said, you should give it to God. She had to stop and think about that. She's like, what? What, you want me to give my last? Stop and think about it. Is, is he my, is he the God of, is his nature to be faithful? I'm going to have to think about it. Is this a guy who will keep his covenant? She had to think about it. Or what about the woman whose idea was to build an apartment for Elijah when he was traveling around. He kept showing up at their house and they didn't have a place for him to sleep. So she went to her husband one day and she says, husband, I don't know what his name was, husband, she said, I think we should build the prophet a, an apartment. Let's build, him a, let's build him a place so that when he comes, he'll have a place to stay with, with our house. And when she told the husband, come on, every husband knows. I don't, they had to stop and think about this. Like, do we really want the prophet around that much? But if you know the story, that bedroom that they built became the instrument for her barrenness to be broken and for her little boy, he was about 12 years old, he died out in the field, he was resurrected on the very bed that they had provided for uh, the prophet because your faith fuels your future. Oh, come on, somebody. Your faith will come back into your future. And I don't know why all these gifts have to do with women. How about Jesus in Gethsemane? 
Father, you want me to give what? My life? I got to stop and think about it. And in Gethsemane, he's saying, Lord, if it's possible, Father, if there's any other way. But for the joy that was set before him, he took on the cross and he demonstrated a new level of glory. The resurrection came because Jesus was willing to give a stop and think about it gift. And we live in a new glory because of what these guys have given Beck, I want you to come and tell a story uh, that happened in our lives. Many of you have heard the pots and pans story, but I want you to hear this because this is such an example of revelation gift in our family. And besides, I can tell you need to laugh a little bit, so get ready. All right, so tell this story if you would, please. So many people have heard the pots and pans story. Come on, let's see. How many of you have <laughs> never heard the pots and pans story? Raise your hand. Oh, look, look at that. Awesome. That's thousands and thousands of people if you count online, I'm sure. So 20 years ago, 2004, we were worshiping in what is now the Children's Center. None of these buildings right here were even in existence. We were dreaming. We were imagining building a worship center. And we were entering into a 24-month, just like now, capital campaign to have faith to build a new worship center that God had put in our hearts to dream about. And, and so Jim and I wanted to be in leadership. We wanted to lead the way. And we were asking the Lord, what do you want us to do? And we both kind of sort of felt like God was saying, I really want you to give one year salary over the next two years. If you do the math, I'm not very good at math, but if you do the math, you'll understand that that's 50% of our income we would give to the building program. And on top of that would be the tithe. On top of that would be our missions offering. And so, like, it was huge. So we just both said, yeah, let's do that. We could do that. Um, Katie's still walking through trauma from that time of her life because it was like no Christmas, no birthdays. I sold my car, uh, so we became a one-car family again, got rid of my phone, got rid of anything had to, had a monthly bill. We got rid of it, you know, and, and so it was like, okay, I'm a, I could be a missionary. I was called to be a missionary. I'm going to pretend I'm in Africa and there's no Walmarts, there's no Targets. I can do this. This is going to be great. This is going to be fun. You know me. I like big ideas and projects until I'm like three weeks into it, right? And then it's like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. So one Sunday we come home and Jim does what he always does is lay down on the couch and uh, checking out the TV channels, what we have without direct TV or anything like that. And he found a game to watch. And I went to the bedroom and I was doing the same thing, clicking through what channels do we have now on our television. And I came across this channel I had never seen before. This is 20 years ago. And it was called the Home Shopping Network. Have any of you ever seen the Home Shopping Network? Well, I had never seen that before. But at that moment, when I turned on that channel, I was now Eve in the Garden of Eden with that apple tree right there. And that temptation overcame me. And I was just like, on that channel was Wolfgang Puck selling pots and pans, stainless steel pots and pans. And all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming desire. I want those pots and pans. I need those pots and pans. Y'all, I don't cook, okay? I don't cook. I don't need pots and pans because I don't cook. But I, all of a sudden, I was going to be the best pastor's wife, become hospitable, have people over my house. I was going to cook these meals if I could just have those pots and pans. And I forgot about the pledge. I forgot about the commitment. And I get on that phone, the landline right there, and I'm under the covers, you know, in case Jim comes in. And I'm under the covers, and I'm putting in my credit card into the phone. I'd never done this before. And Jim comes walking in. And when he walked in, you guys, I didn't pass go. I went straight to hell because he asked me, like, who are you talking to? And I just lied. I lied. I said, I'm, I'm talking to our son. He was at Texas Tech at the time. And from there, it was just downhill. All the rest of the evening, I'm trying to, you know, order those pots and pans. And Jim keeps walking in. And finally, I just hang up the phone. And the next day, I come to church to work and I pull up the Home Shopping Network on the computer <laughs> and I'm like, there's these, these, where's Wolfgang Puck Pots and Pans? And I found them and I'm putting them in my shopping cart and all those things, you know, if you order the pots and pans and get the, you get the measuring cups and the tea kettle and I'm putting it all in my shopping cart and this thought comes through my mind just as I'm getting ready to push purpose because I had already put my credit card in there and it was ready to buy it. And this thought came through my mind, like, what are you going to tell Jim if he's at the house when all those boxes show up? And how are you going to explain to him new pots and pans after you made a commitment to God, to the church, to Jim, to everyone that you weren't going to spend any money over the next two years? And so I, I deleted it and I didn't buy those pots and pans. And the immediate 
emotion was guilt and shame and self-hatred. And I just became overwhelmed with the failure, you know, how you've fallen short again, Becky, and you are a terrible pastor's wife, and Jim would be better off without you in his life. I mean, I just went dark, really dark place. The next day happened to be my birthday, and we had planned this um, informational meeting for all the ladies to come celebrate my birthday and to learn about a new ministry we were going to start called Girlfriends. How many of you remember that? We started in January of 2005, so this is December of 20. 2004, and so we had figured, you know, people come to my birthday party, we can tell them about uh, girlfriends and get them to sign up for all the different things, and so that's what we did. But the whole night, right, this feeling of guilt and shame and self-hatred was so overwhelming to me. And, and at the end of that meeting that we had, they had a birthday cake for me, and they brought out this big box, and I opened up my present, and guess what's inside there? Pots and pans. That's right, you guys, pots and pans. And the overwhelming love of God just changed my life that moment. Like, God was like, I love you, Becky. Yeah. I have good gifts for you. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm a good father, and I know the desires of your heart. I have put desire within you. It's of me, your desires, and I have already gone before you to take care of it. You don't have to manipulate and lie and maneuver for my goodness. I have, and so that was my testimony. For 10 years, you guys, I told that story as I shared about how God loves us, and he knows the desires of our heart. Well, 10 years later, we're already in this building. We paid off the pledge, you know, we're in the, we're in, and we buy a new house. God gives us a brand, a, a new home, a desire of our heart, our dream home 10 years ago. And so it's kind of modern. I had a lady come in, a painter, and she was painting all the walls and the doors. And she gets to the kitchen, and she's painting all the kitchen cabinets inside and out. And there was a drawer under our stovetop, and it was stuck, but I thought it was broken. I thought it was a fake drawer. I didn't know it was broken. I thought it was a fake drawer. Well, she comes in, and she figures out it's not, it's not a fake drawer. It's a real drawer. It was just broken. And she opens up that drawer, and she says, Pastor Becky, there's some stuff in here. And I go over there, and she's taking them all out. You guys, it's a whole set of stainless steel Wolfgang Puck pots and pans in the house 10 years later. And I call the lady up, and I'm like, ma'am, you left a whole set of Wolfgang Puck pots and pans. And she's like, oh, I don't want those. I bought those 10 years ago on Home Shopping Network, you guys. So the moment, the time that I was struggling with the faithfulness and goodness of God, trying to make things happen in my own strength, God had already gone before me. Ten years later, down the road, he knew we would buy that house, and that woman would have left Wolfgang Puck Pots and Pans. And you guys, God knows yeah. the desires of your heart. He knows what you long for, and he's already in your future waiting for you to catch up to him. And so, you know, whenever we struggle with faith to believe for our family or for our church or for our city or for you, we remember God's faithfulness. No, he's the God of pots and pans. Yeah. He's already gone into our future, and he's already made a way. And so I'm so thankful, right? Yeah. We were able to end those two years. God was was so faithful. He gave us a used car. Somebody gave us a used car. And from that moment on, we've never had to have a car payment because people actually give us cars. I mean, we've been given two Range Rovers. I mean, we, God is so faithful, you guys. You can't outgive God. Yeah. And the, and the point. Yeah, come on, give God praise like, it, like it's your pots and pans. Come on. Like it's your Range Rover. Come on, give, give God praise. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the reason I wanted you to, here's the reason I wanted you to hear that story. That story has become a root in our life. It, it's a root. There are storms, there are adversities that come. But there's something, I mean, of course there's the scripture, but there's a real life story in our life. It says, no, God is faithful. Our God is faithful. And he lavishes his love.